on Graphene Technologies. The first time we address this new material. Thank you all of you for joining. In the next two hours, we're gonna find business opportunities for the Graphene Network. Do you remember the Nobel Prize for Physics 11 years ago? It went to Professor Haim and Novoselov for the research into graphene. And the discovery of graphene came from a chance observation of people cleaning graphite to use it in the scanning tunnel in microscope. They use a scotch tape. I simply picked up this uh, piece of scotch tape from the, from the dustbin and made a uh, first transistor out of it, and th that very first sample did work immediately. Soon after that Nobel Prize was awarded, key research commenced using graphene for two very specific applications in photonics. Number one, ultra-fast modulators and detectors for optoelectronic devices or in photonic integrated circuits. Number two, new cameras with breakthrough performance offering extremely high spectral range. That research quickly led to new products. However, although small quantities are feasible, when it comes to high volume production, today's primary industry concern is to understand who will supply graphene in large quantities at the right price. Currently, there are not many graphene foundries or graphene manufacturing centers. So on Monday, 18th of October 2021, let's discuss how this could change. I want to review what's been achieved so far by emerging companies like Emberion. Their goal is to revolutionize infrared photodetectors and thermal sensors in applications ranging from hyperspectral and thermal imaging to night vision and X-ray detection. A few days ago, I was amazed by their demonstrator at the vision show in Stuttgart. They could detect chemical traces on pieces of clothing. That explains my hat. Or what about the UK-Italian venture Cam Graphic? Their core product is Graphene Photonics Platform for ultra-fast datacom applications. But for those success stories to evolve and flourish, we need graphene foundries. In Europe, we have two important graphene photonics producers being developed at the moment. One is UK-based Paragraph and the other IMEC Graphene in Belgium. So, if we take the camera from Emberion or the silicon photonics from Cam Graphic, what are the really unique selling points of this technology? Why should people choose a graphene camera instead of indium gallium arsenide? Why consider adding graphene to silicon photonics instead of using the standard silicon germanium for detectors or modulators? Graphene is great, so the most important question is how to accelerate things further. So let's ask the current graphene foundries the epic question. Testing, metrology, packaging, deposition, adhesives, what do you need? Your wish is our command. Of course, we also need to involve the end users, which is why automaker Stellantis, with 300,000 people in 50 countries, is an important player in our Zoom room. We'll also welcome Rockley Photonics, ATNS, Horiva, as well as consumer electronics giant Electrolux. To be part of the conversation and part of the exciting business future, be sure to participate on Monday, October 18th. The fun with graphene starts at exactly 3 p.m. Thank you very much, all of you, for getting that invitation and for participating in the first ever, the first ever online technology meeting on graphene technologies. I'm really happy to have here companies doing graphene, companies utilizing graphene for their products, but this meeting is for all the rest, for all the rest of you to help those companies develop their technology, their foundry platform and their products into potentially devices that will revolutionize the photonic industry. 
Today, I am here talking on behalf of the European Photonic Industry Consortium, 750 members of EPIC. Thank you very much for your support. Our staff combines people with expertise on photonic integrated circuits, on optics, on medical, on data com telecom, on quantum technologies, and we were here to bring you together, to provide you access to our network, to help you raise capital, to help you raise money for your startup, to help you find a job in photonics. Jobsinphotonics.com is the biggest website worldwide to find a job in photonics and to help you also finding market reports. Those market reports are very expensive sometimes for the companies to obtain. If you are an Epic member, you get a long list of these market reports for your company strategy. Today we are talking about graphene technologies. We are in the mid half season. We have announced all online meetings all the way to Christmas. Pay special attention to the one next week on Monday, low light cameras. It's going to be spectacular. But today, today, graphene technology. And also, in a couple of weeks, we have our second quantum meeting on ion traps, gravitometers, and other quantum sensors that are also going to be great. But today, as I said, is graphene graphene technology and applications. We worked very hard on this meeting because we really wanted, we really wanted to bring the key members on this sector to in contact with the rest of our members to understand what kind of challenges there are in the testing, in the packaging, in the online manufacturing for this. And we want to see how we can help. And to see how we can help, I want to introduce, I want to present my partner in crime in this meeting, the person who took charge on having the perfect agenda and the perfect supply chain, Antonio Raspa, Innovation Manager of Epic. Thank you very much for being here. What's going to happen now? Oh, we will have uh, really uh, an interesting discussion and uh, the the interesting point is that the discussion is not only with our uh, presenters, uh, with our panelists, but with all the uh, supply chain that we have here. Clearly, as usual, we try to figure out what could be uh, a realistic supply chain. And here, really, looking on the participant, we will have really all the main player. We have the end users, and the end user really is impressive. We have people from aerospace as well as home appliance glasses and ophthalmology, ophthalmics application. And then we have all the other uh, stakeholders, graphene uh, people, photonic integrated circuits, thin film coatings, uh, glass and optics, laser, and what else. Here, uh, I really foresee for a very interesting discussion. So uh, I will really stop my talk because it's necessary to, to hear the people in the meeting. Thank you very much. This slide only corresponds to the companies who register for the meeting today. If you're an Epic member and you miss your logo at this slide, only means that you forgot to register to the meeting. Don't let it happen again. You have to participate in the meetings that Epic organizes for you because we do it only, only for you. And also to remind everyone that you have to look your best because this meeting is live streamed in YouTube and it will be there forever. So for those of you attending in YouTube, just make sure that you write your questions in the chat. And of course, if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.posto at epic-asoc.com. Tell me why you want to get in touch with them, and I will make sure that you get introduced. It is time to talk graphene. It was our introduction to make sure that you understand what this meeting is about. But remember, this meeting is about connections. So constantly, constantly write your questions in the chat because we really want you to interact with them. We wanted to start Epic Style. I wanted to start with one company that really is making themselves a different company in the graphene ecosystem. We are going to go all the way to the United Kingdom, and we're going to go to meet the company Paragraph, the first pure play foundry on graphene technologies that we're going to have in Europe. Oli Morris, thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us about Paragraph. Most important, Oli, tell us how the rest of the community, the 750 Epic members, can help you be even greater than your ideas. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Oli Morris. I work as a business developer here at Paragraph. Can you go to slide show mode? There we go. Perfect. There we go. So yes, as, as Jose said, Oli Morris here. I work as a business developer here at Paragraph. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our company to the Epic community today. I'm speaking to you from Paragraph's headquarters, just north of Cambridge. And here, the, uh, the only thing flatter than the graphene we make is the landscape in which we make it. And it's at this facility that we manufacture uh, paragraph-designed graphene devices. 
at the wafer scale with CMOS compatible processes. We also have a presence in North America and Japan, if that's more convenient for you. And I'm sure that we'll be expanding further in the near future. Paragraph's business is to be the device company that delivers the promise of graphene electronics. And whilst graphene may has many exceptional material qualities, our focus is on delivering devices that exploit its electrical and its electro optic. We're doing this by eliminating what has been a major barrier to graphene commercialization, the use of a copper substrate and transfer process. This established transfer technique has delivered scalable graphene production, but the yield can be unreliable, contaminants can deteriorate graphene performance, and the use of copper risks poisoning CMOS processing flows and boundary environments. So our solution, which we use to underpin our devices, is a technology that enables us to synthesize graphene direct on a range of semiconductor and insulator substrates, eliminating the need for copper and the transfer process. This makes our solution CMOS compatible, and we can deploy it on standard semiconductor tooling to achieve large scale volume production, which is another benefit. Already we've used our capability to bring to market a graphene device, which is our graphene hall sensor that people can use to measure magnetic fields. We manufacture this device at the weight scale using CMOS compatible processes and the part is shipping now. The unique performance of the part, which is enabled by the unique performance of the graphene, is finding applications in particle accelerators, medical systems, battery cell mapping, and quantum computing, to name a few. And we've also proven our biosensor concept, where the conductivity of our graphene is modified when various biological nasties bind to it. This has use in gas sensing, chemical detection, and in vitro diagnostic tests, where graphene, because of its biocompatibility, can be used to detect a wide variety of viruses and other pathogens. And as our expansion continues, we have programs and projects around graphene electronics. And we've begun to take an interest in graphene optoelectronic solutions because we see clear, trends in the data comms market for faster, lower power data comms links. The delivery mechanism for this lower power operation will, we believe, favor a continued merging and integration of logic and compute with photonic transceiver technologies. So graphene components offering more dense packing, circuit simplification, much lower power consumption, faster speeds, and, and this is the important bit we think, that can be manufactured as part of a CMOS process flow are attractive solutions. So we're set to work on this, and what's great to see is that we're not the only ones who believe in this future. Our vision is shared by others on the call today, and we also note industrial research on this topic, such as NTT's fantastic work towards all optical systems including graphene-based modulators and switches, Palace's work on optoelectronic mixing to improve and simplify receiver systems. Two six have indicated an interest in Vixel sources that incorporate graphene layers to help spread current and modulate the beam. And broadband emitters have also been shown to be possible by work undertaken at Columbia and Kyunghee universities. Presently, we're starting to transition theory into practice, which is really exciting for us. We know that device models can only go so far and will only be believed to a point. So by working with others in the community, we're beginning to demonstrate the possibility of graphene optoelectronic devices for data comms applications and the suitability of our technology for delivering this potential at a scale and cost that the market demands. And so we want to hear from you. If what we're doing sounds interesting, then please do get in touch. We're 70 people and continuing to hire. 
and we have expertise in a wide variety of material systems spanning material growth to device physics, manufacture and beyond. Importantly, we're not fabulous. We have our own tools at our own site, which allows us to shorten the development cycle. And we're located next to a great cake factory, Tom's Cake, if you need the deal to be further sweet. I can be reached at my email address here. So if you think we could collaborate on or around this topic of graphene photonics, then it will be great to hear from you. And finally, thanks so much to Jose and everyone at Epic for being so warm and welcoming and for giving us the opportunity to present today. We really appreciate your friendliness and are excited to be part of this community. Thank you very much, Oli. I have to say that we have a common friend, a common friend who is Colin Humphries, which is a person that I really, really, really look up to. And he's the one who told me uh, almost a decade ago that this was going to happen, having a foundry on graphene technologies in Europe, pure, pure play. And I really love that you managed to make it happen. But as I told you, Oli, this meeting is to find you partners. So I yeah. want to go through your Santa Claus wish list and see who can help you. And to start that, we're going to go to Fraunhofer ICTM in Berlin because Oliver Kirsch has something on his mind. Oliver, guten Tag, what's on your mind? Oliver from Fraunhofer ICTM. We may have lost contact. That's one of the problems to have the meeting live. But I'm going to read his question. He's talking regarding the slide for Oliver is here. Come on, Oliver. You can ask the question yourself. Oliver? Yes, tell us. We see the smoke from Lost, but we cannot see you. So I'm going to read the question. The question is, regarding slide four, direct to wafer technology, is this solution in principle scalable to panel level technologies? Can, can we, is the, the, the direct to wafer scalable? Uh, so it's, it's scalable uh, in line with sort of traditional semiconductor tools. That's the best thing to say. Okay. So now I want to go to the rest of the, the Christmas list. We are setting up a foundry. So the first thing to set up a foundry is that you need to have a, a PDK that is readable to the companies who want to access that foundry, the process design kit. What is the current state of the art? Uh, can, how can people interact with such foundry? Is there a PDK that people can actually get? Um, no, and, and I think it's probably worthwhile me pointing out at this point that um, we are a device manufacturer and device designer. So, you know, um, we are, yeah, we are undertaking um, a lot of design work ourselves. And we do invite and encourage collaboration with us on, a, on our devices. Um, but yeah, I, I you know, uh, and in those collaborations, people will, will begin to understand you know, how our manufacturing technology can be used to make their, you know, their, their plans realizable. All right. Uh, one thing that I also want to ask you is about the equipment for the for the clean room itself. So you have uh, you are setting up a factory. Uh, you want to do co-design with your customers of the future models that you're gonna that you want to co-commercialize with your customers and uh, how how is uh, the current state of the art on the equipment that you have and is there any any particular unmet need any particular wish because after you talk i'm going to go to evg because he's represented in the group and i want to ask him how they see this is a potential room for cooperation so Oli, equipment for the manufacturing any particular need um so we want to make sure that everything we do is done and can be done on standard semiconductor tooling. Uh, this is very important to us. We recognize that um, graphene will be adopted if it, uh, if it fits into you know, the, the manufacturing supply chain that already exists. Um, we feel quite strongly about this. Um, so we are very interested very excited to hear about people who are developing next generation semiconductor tools. Um, you know, people that are building tools that are going to go into the next processing node for you know, silicon, that sort of thing, to give us, you know, to give us insights into you know, what 
what kind of tools we should have in our mind because and I think probably everybody I hope will agree, will agree I'll find out um, you know it's a very long game right it's been a very long game it will probably be a you know it, 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 it could well be um, you know a few years yet um, before the ultimate goals of graphene are realized and so we need to make sure that we match ourselves up with the tools that are going to be in the foundries in a few years this is of this course an early start but we do have evg uh, martin ivel halbert thank you very much for being with us all the way from from austria all the way from florian anin semiconductor manufacturer evg uh, when it comes to the companies who tell you we need to have semiconductor-like equipment, but they have a completely new material in the industry, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? We cannot hear you, Martin. I think this is one of the things that we are having trouble, but since I'm going to ask the same question to Cedric later for when IMAX speaks, please, uh, my team is going to contact you to solve the audio problem because we want to hear from you later. But if that's okay now, I want to go to one of the companies who we want them to be the driver of silicon photonics in the future. I'm talking, of course, to about Rockley Photonics. And Cyril uh, Minkenberg is here with us this afternoon. Rockley Photonics, everybody's hearing about them because of the biosensing uh, application with a beautiful fruit company. But uh, Cyril, today you're here to explore what are the possibilities of uh, graphene as a material to silicon photonics. When it comes to the detectors and modulators of silicon photonics, I think in particular detectors, what kind of challenges are you seeing in silicon photonics? Are we looking for more efficiency? Are we looking for price reduction? Are we looking for semiconductor-like uh, fabs? What, what is the, the first challenge that you see for a foundry like paragraph? Um, so definitely in the comm space, I think, you know, we're going to see in the, you know, next, let's say two or three years, you know, another transition to um, a 200 uh, gig per channel. Uh, so this, this, this will pose problems for um, existing a modulator as well as uh, as detector designs. It's not clear yet whether we really need to adopt um, you know a new material system to, to overcome um, that hurdle. It's still a bit um, early days, but you know it's always good to have a fallback solution uh, in case um, you know either you can't make it work at all, or the way that you can make it work is just uh, either not not cost efficient or or not energy efficient. So it's something that we've we've been monitoring, and in fact, I've spoken to Oli a couple of times in the in the past, and um, I saw this meeting, and I realized that in fact the ball is in my court to <laughs> to continue the conversation. So I will in fact reach out to Oli again uh, after this meeting. Oli, I know because I have introduced you to many silicon photonics manufacturers. Uh, what are the main challenges? What are the main? What is the current state of the art in bringing together the graphene world and the silicon photonics or other photonic integrated? technologies together? Uh, so I think you know, the industry is um, ultimately people want to go faster and use less power. And, and that's, that's what needs to be aimed for. You know, that's when I advocate for the customer within, within Paragraph, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm standing up and saying the customer wants. Um, and I think you know, what the customer wants to hear, what, what everybody wants to hear is that um, is that this can be done at the wafer scale with CMOS compatible processes. Um, you know, so that um, so so that so as I put in the slides, so that um, you know, people can begin to see this as as a sort of a single um, single manufacturing process. To bring together silicon photonics and graphene, uh, he's going to speak later, but I want him to say hello at this stage. All the way from Pisa, Italy, we actually have Alessio Pirastu in the room. Alessio, thank you very much. Grazie mille for being with us today. How do you see, uh, seeing together, seeing the room today, Rockley Photonics and Silicon Photonics, uh, success story of the ecosystem? How do you see the current challenge of bringing graphene as a, as a material for photonic integration? 
thanks, uh, Jose. So there are, in my opinion, many challenges uh, in, uh, you know, uh, exploit uh, and uh, uh, deploy the, this technology. So for sure, it is, uh, I must say that it is the most promising technology to satisfy the uh, next generation uh, demand of uh, optical devices, in particular for telecommunications. But in terms of, uh, um, uh, to be pragmatic, uh, of course, uh, what is needed now is uh, a way to uh, basically uh, make the graphene and the silicon photonics as a single platform. And uh, um, two key factors, technically speaking, one is to improve the efficiency of the graphene with respect to the, uh, uh, the light traveling into the uh, PICs. And then of course, uh, um, the uh, encap what, what we call in encapsulation. So how to make devices without degrading, degrading the graphene properties. So this is the technical challenge, of course, we are addressing in our, uh, in our company for sure. And then of course, and I will talk later in my presentation, the uh, four uh, performance that we must guarantee in order to consider the, the graphene photonics as a new platform, which are for sure uh, uh, bandwidth density, uh, cost reduction, power consumption reduction, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the possibility to work at uh, high temperature, which is uh, a common a common topic, uh, uh, I would say, in the data centers and 5G environments. So okay. this must be addressed very well. But you know what Cyril from Rockley Photon is thinking about? He's thinking, yes, it's good about the cost. I like that. But think even further, because I'm going to put all this graphene-based silicon photonic chips into wearables in the ultra high volume production. So one of the things that we need to answer in this meeting is scalability. And I think the best person to answer that, we are going to go to the most important R&D center in Europe. We are going to go to IMEC to talk about IMEC Graphene. And to meet Cedric Heigebart, who is one of the key people in the Graphene flagship in Europe and also the, the leader for IMEC Graphene. Cedric, thank you very much for being with us. I want to hear your story but most important, after your presentation, I want to revisit what we already discussed with Paragraph and go one by one to companies like Luxotica, like AT&S, like Interplex, like Biosense, to see how they can use the current state of the art of iMegraphene. Cedric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will start with, can you see my, sh my screen or not? Yes, crystal clear, but you need to go slide share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go to yes. the slide, uh, slide share mod modus. Very good. Nothing. And it's... now switch, switch the display settings. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, okay, so this is going. Um, first of all, thank you for, for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, uh, well, to talk to this, this very interesting community. Uh, it's a pleasure and it's an honor for me to, uh, to be able to, uh, to talk to you. Um, well, I, I think what, what most of you know is, is what IMIC is, but, but still I, I want to, um, yeah, to emphasize a little bit um, what we try to do, because I think it's, a, it's important also because there are some, some parts that, that, that could be of use later on. So basically what we are looking at is, is concepts and, and we are, well, we have a lab infrastructure, we are maturing some concepts or at least looking into concepts in the lab. And then we are thinking already in, in, a, in a late phase in the lab on how we can bring that to the fab. And, and this is typically the, the, the very difficult step that needs to be taken um, to, to go from a lab technology, which has proven to be very um, uh, promising to something that is scalable. And this is typically what, 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 what IMIC is doing and which is our focus. And once we have done that to a certain success, what we also try to do is to offering some of these um, yeah, early technologies in, in, um, yeah, in, in pilot lines or, or in, in services. And I think this is very known in the community. And, and this, uh, that's also why I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. And the, the last point that I want to say here is that, that indeed we are uh, together with, with uh, the European Union and with the Graphene flagship, we are trying to do the same for 2D materials. And so we are hoping that in a few years from now, we will be able to offering some of these early technologies, um, well, integration technologies for, for 2D materials uh, to the community and also to the, the, yeah, the photonics community. Um, and then of course, the goal is to handle it over to the industry 
who is uh, because then typically our role is finalized and and then we go the next stage and we will take an, an, another material in in the funnel there um our vision on on um well why graphene is is uh, kind of interesting for us and and that was one of the first things that that we looked at is is trying to find out if we can um well we have the silicon photonics um and and if we can add active material being graphene on top in a simple way in such a way that we can uh, continue the scaling and at, a, at an interesting cost and so on and so uh, uh, about six six years ago or, or seven years ago we, we published our first papers in in this uh, region which were at that moment in time lab-based devices and and uh, combined with uh, fab uh, silicon uh, waveguides and uh, this was showing very promising results. And then, well, we had uh, quite some trouble in stabilizing that process because in the lab, it's, it's difficult to have reproducible results uh, and so on. And uh, that's why we, uh, at some point in time, we decided to move to, to, to a FAP flow. And this is basically um, um, how it looks like. So we have the silicon waveguides uh, that are plannerized uh, in our fab. Then we do a transfer of graphene. We are doing that together with uh, partners, but also in-house. So we are, we're relying on graphenea here. Then we are uh, encapsulating and, and doing a full integration scheme, which is fully relying on uh, silicon processing tools that are available in our 300 millimeter pilot fab. So in that sense, <coughs> all these uh, uh, process steps could be uh, let's say, handled over or transferred to a, a foundry model or a foundry uh, company. And that's very important for us. And there are a few steps which are requiring attention and which are not standard. Uh, and one of the first one is, of course, is the transfer of graphene. While well, we have heard that Paragraph has developed technology to grow directly, uh, we are not growing uh, graphene directly um, because um, at this moment in time, well, we, we cannot grow graphene with the required quality directly uh, in-house. In so it would be interesting to see what Paragraph can do there. But we are growing um, um, on a template, which means that we need to develop um, a, a transfer technology. Transfer technology can also have advantages because it allows you to... to uh, control very well what's happening at the interface. At the end, graphene is a monolayer of material. So beside the bulk of the material, which is almost nothing, interfaces are extremely crucial. And, and controlling interfaces is maybe even more important in the, in the future integration of 2D materials uh, than, than really controlling uh, the, the material per se. Um, well, well, what you see here is, is uh, the flow that, we, that I schematically demonstrated before. Here you see it fully like integrated in 300 millimeter um, um, wafers. This is a cross-section TEM. And uh, where the graphene layers lays below that aluminum oxide uh, line that you see here, but graphene is so thin that you cannot see it. And what you also can see is that it is contacted through side contacts. So the graphene is, is going into the metal here and, and uh, in that way, we are contacting uh, towards the graphene. And uh, in that sense, we can make an electroabsorption modulator. And we basically uh, capati capacitively modulate the, the Fermi level in the graphene to uh, a contact that goes uh, to the silicon here and on. If we take a zoom to where the graphene is in the active um, uh, region, we can already immediately see that it's not that there is still room for optimization. We can see that the oxide thickness is not perfect, but this is something that we can engineer and that we can work towards. And this is very important to have that first step because from now on we can continuously engineering and improving and step by step improving uh, basically the performance. What you can already see is that in the first learning cycles, we had a non-optimized encapsulation, and then we, we worked on optimizing the encapsulation layer. And what, what uh, can immediately be seen is that, that um, while these are accumulation plots that are uh, uh, plotting the extinction ratio, well, we can see that with the optimized uh, encapsulation, we have a much cleaner and more uniform performance. 
um, and which is the same that you can see with the modulation efficiency and so on. So here you can see that modulation efficiency is, is non-uniform over the wafer and we substantially improve it. This is only a starting point. We, we can now start to engineer and improving step by step uh, all these different steps. What is very important to know is that um, we have achieved similar performance with this integrated material in the fab as the best devices we had in the lab. But the big difference is that now we have a yield of 90 to 95% in the optimized conditions. In the lab, we have the yield that was less than 20% because of the variation of the process variability that you typically achieve in the lab, where you need to pick a champion device. Here we start to have very uniform device performance all over. We also know where we need to improve, and this is, this is a way to build up that platform. So at, to conclude is that, well, we're working very hard to try to bring these materials, these 2D materials um, to a, uh, integration environment, which is uh, uh, completely compatible with semiconductor standards. And, and we are demonstrating this here on uh, silicon photonics. We see immediately that for the similar materials, so the same graphene from Graphenea, when we do the integration, we achieve similar results. But the thing is that we, we have a much better yield all over, which is uh, very promising. So it means that if we work on improving the quality of the graphene and the transfer, we, we normally, the rest of the processing will allow us to have very stable and good yield uh, results. Um, well, we, we, we still believe that we, we can gain major, well, we can make major step forwards by improving basically the quality of the graphene and the quality of the transfer. And there we are working in the 2D EPL together with, with different partners to, to, uh, to make that happen. And we hope that in, in three to five, five years from now, we will have a full ecosystem where we will have semiconductor tools and, and um, um, integrated in our uh, pilot line fab in such a way that we can demonstrate processing on 300 millimeter and that we can demonstrate the upscalability of all these processes, which would be key uh, because uh, if you have that and you can demonstrate the potential, well, foundry, uh, the foundries can then uh, look to that ecosystem, buy that ecosystem, and, and uh, bring these new processes on the market. And yeah, this is what I wanted to, uh, um, yeah, to tell about um, what, what IMIC is doing for Graphene at this moment in time. And I just wanted to uh, yeah, thank a little bit of people who worked uh, in this process. And I want to thank you. Uh, when I contacted you a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of months ago, and telling you that I really wanted to boom the, the, the activities in graphene, you were the first person in our mind to lead this activity. And here I would like to ask you to be as involved as we can with, with Epic to work together with the flagship and to bring all the industrial partners of Epic to you. Uh, you mentioned a few times the interest in working closer with semiconductor companies. I'm going to introduce you now in this Q&A to the market leader on PCB boards, AT and S. Eric Schleffer, thank you very much for being with us today. I want this to happen. Eric, thank you. What's on your mind after this? Yeah, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Cedric. It was a very promising and a very interesting uh, presentation you had already. Uh, from PCP and interconnect perspective, I have some questions. Uh, first is, you know, uh, when we are talking, when you're talking about the deposition, uh, can you imagine? Uh, that you also can apply it in a, in a kind of sputtering process uh, on a, a copper conductive layer, for instance, not just on, 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 on silicon. Um, we, are, we are switching now to, to PCP more or less. It means to dielectric and copper as a conductive layer. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that with the uh, with, the spot, with the sputtering process yeah, that you can deposit uh, the graphene material on, on copper, uh, for instance. Yes. Um, with sputtering technologies, graphene, well, you, you, you can deposit graphitic material, but you cannot deposit graphene. And okay. um, so, so I, I don't think, well, at least I, I'm not aware that anybody has demonstrated that they can deposit uh, uh, graphene through PVD. 
Um, um, typically, you need to have relatively high temperature budgets to be able to, to form these um, hexagons that are needed. Um, so it's not such an easy process to, to make graphene. Of course, if you can live with uh, nanocrystallites, uh, then, then there are several possibilities that, that, uh, yeah, that could work. And by the way, the, there is, well, we are also looking into these uh, growing graphene directly on interconnects. Um, uh, why? Because it's, it's, um, it's, protect, it's protecting the interconnect. It's, um, it's uh, avoiding copper indiffusion into the silicon oxide around and so on, if you can uh, encapsulate graphene, uh, uh, the interconnect with graphene. So, so definitely people are, uh, are looking into that. Um, but then again, it is grown by CVD at, at uh, interconnect compatible uh, temperatures, but the graphene quality that we achieve there is, is slightly less compared to what you uh, achieve, well, what you need to make the most performant electroabsorption modulators and detectors in photonics. Okay. Where you really need to achieve, let's say, the best possible graphene performance, because otherwise you cannot compete with the existing uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. So it means first finalize uh, the existing uh, development on wafer level before thinking about to implement it in other process steps. Is this um, somehow correct? Well, yes and no. On the on the other hand, what what you also see is that. Um, um, if, if you look to what Samsung published in 2010 and, and even today in, in China and Korea, you have companies who are making graphene um, on roll-to-roll -roll applications where they are depositing the graphene mm -hmm. on the polymer. And, and this is uh, relatively cheap graphene and, and uh, high quality graphene also. So maybe if, if you can laminate them, there are also ways to integrate your graphene, but this is not fully compatible with silicon processes. Mm -hmm. Semiconductor standards are extremely, uh, yeah, how to say, extremely demanding towards particle levels, contamination levels, uh, uh, flatness of surfaces, uh, uniformity, uh, and and well, once you go to polymers and so on, polymer rolls, then then typically you're out of range there. But for a lot of other applications, like I think packaging and so on, there you could you could work maybe with these these kind of approaches. So maybe right. it's Thank you. to think about it. For Thank Paragraph, you. for CanGraphic, and also, of course, for IMEC, uh, I want to ask you this, Eric, uh, on their behalf. Eric Sleffer from ATNS, one question. You joined TEPIC because you wanted to set up a supply chain of bringing photonics to PCB board manufacturers. So what is your interest in graphene? What the problem do you want to solve with graphene material from a PCB manufacturing perspective? Eric is muted. Yeah, Eric. Ah, sorry. So uh, you set up a supply chain with photonic companies for silic bringing silicon photonics to PCB boards thanks to the to your Epic membership. I would like to ask you what is your interest in graphene? What problem do you want to solve with graphene in PCB boards? It's very easy to explain. Graphene is a superconductor, and it means it might be for interest uh, for signal speed but for heat dissipation, thermal management concepts as well. ATNS has been one of the key companies in PC boards, one of the market leaders in PC boards, and we have it in Europe, we have it in Austria. We need to help them. So uh, Alessio from Cam Graphic, Oli from Paragraph, and Cedric from IMEC, if you help Eric, you help Europe, I want to set up a meeting individually with the two of you to find something happening. But uh, Cedric, mm -hmm. I promise you two semiconductor manufacturers. The second one is Elmos Semiconductor. I have Thomas Rotter in the room representing Elmos. Thomas, thank you very much for joining. You just saw the presentations from, um, from Paragraph and from IMEC. What is in your mind and what is your interest in graphene? Hello, Jose, and hello to the community. Uh, of course, uh, Amos is a semiconductor um, manufacturing, um, mainly on, uh, silicon on a only silicon base. So uh, graphene is, uh, um, has some benefit if you're uh, if, if it's uh, more than silicon. So uh, we, we have to exploit uh, the graphene's uh, special properties uh, for, uh, as for applications like uh, uh, hall sensor and also thinking about um, 
uh, in the um, absorbing um, of uh, photons, uh, not in the uh, visible or near infrared range, but on, in the um, mid, uh, mid infrared range uh, where uh, we can um, take benefit of the uh, integration of, of the graphene, but only uh, if the, uh, the um, integration is worth doing this. So this are uh, the main key, key factors. It has to be uh, um, uh, easy, um, um, let's say uh, completely full um, um, of, um, post CMOS process, uh, which can be handled uh, as a, um, um, as an add-on by a, a service provider. You are very interested in using graphene as a as a whole sensor, as a proximity sensor. Yes. Uh, I I what uh, I'm gonna go to Cedric, then to Oli, and then to Alessio very quickly on that. Uh, but Thomas, could you specify a bit more what is the main challenge for that whole sensor that you want to develop? Um, of course, the sensitivity uh, is uh, the main um, um, property. We have to look at uh, the whole sensors. And uh, uh, can you um, um, give, uh, um, maybe um, uh, we have got uh, the silicon-based uh, whole sensors and we have got uh, um, 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 the giant magnetic uh, resistance or, or the um, uh, dedicated um, non-silicon-based uh, um, techniques uh, uh, for the sensitivity improvement. Um, but we, uh, if, if we integrate um, uh, the um, graphene, uh, what what is the performance index uh, we can um, make this graphene integration? Very good, Thomas. So uh, you also have questions in, about the, the uh, graphene as an infrared absorbing material, but I want Emberion to answer those after the presentation. But okay. when it comes to the whole sensor, Cedric uh, from IMEC, I know the, the IMEC sensor very well. IMEC has long expertise on proximity sensors. Is there any way, any, any idea that you have for graphene to be used as a very high efficiency detector for this? Well, again, well, I, I think Hull sensors have been demonstrated um, with um, um, flake-based graphene, which is very high quality material. The, the biggest challenge is in, in upscaling, um, reproducing them uh, massively behaving in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there, it's, it's again, it's the same thing. It's, it's how to manipulate the graphene and, and how to control the interfaces and making sure that, that they are all uh, that the graphene is behaving in the same way all over the wafer, um, but but uh, yeah, okay. This this is a matter of of uh, engineering uh, the technology. I would say it takes time, but if we have a very good focus, I think we can we can we can come quite far. But um, yeah, well, that's that's my personal opinion. I would like to know if either uh, Alessio from CanGraphic or Oli from Pradaf would like to comment on this. Uh, a semiconductor company wants to develop a very high efficient sensor. How do you address it as a manufacturing partner? Alessio first. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so I do agree with Cedric. It's a matter of uh, uh, uniformity <clears throat> and high quality graphene. So there are several methods to, um, to grow graphene. We can talk about uh, continuous film or single crystal, but then what is very important is how to manipulate the graphene during the uh, transfer process mm -hmm. and uh, encapsulation. So this is, is a very critical. It's, uh, I would say, I, I would confirm what Cedric said. It's about uh, a maturity of the technology. It's not about the application in this case. This is my opinion. Would you like to comment on this, Oli too? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we, we make graphene hole sensors at the wave scale with CMOS compatible processes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is something we know uh, a little about. And um, yeah, we, we agree with the others. You know, there's there's um, you know, th there is uh, always work to be done to improve the um, the size of the operation, the, you know, the efficiency and the repeatability. Devices. Um, but uh, yeah, we think this, we're very happy with the progress that we've made to date. Um, um, I've got a, a detailed question. What yes. would be the um, um, 
um, what would we, uh, if we would provide uh, wafers for doing such uh, integration for direct uh, depositing uh, graphene on, on uh, semiconductor wafers on wafer level? Um, are there any um, uh, prerequisites? Um, uh, uh, I mean, um, re regarding the flatness or the finishing of CMP process, or has it to be? Um, um, is a aluminum uh, back end of line um, um, good enough, or has it to be a, a copper um, back end of line? So, um, I think probably the the best answer I can give is that a, a detailed conversation probably requires its own yeah. conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, but, but it's great to meet with you. Yeah, and yeah. Um, thank yeah. Uh, I guess thanks thanks so much uh, for your questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's lovely to see the epic process happening in real time. And uh, yeah, do send me an email. OK, we, we thank you. Yeah. You will see all this is just the beginning. We are going to yeah. bring that wafer to you and to PISA, to CanGraphic, and to Loven, to, to Cedric, to make it happen. Cedric, we have a question for you in the chat. It's coming from a top research in the graphing industry. It's coming from Li Shan Ling about uniformity. Li Shan, thank you very much for being with us. What is on your mind? Hi, um, everyone. Um, as I as, as I listen to the speech from you, I realized that actually the uniformity seems is the, um, the most um, a crucial problem so far for graphene manufacture. And um, indeed, um, if graphene layer is not single layer or the defect density is too high, I don't think the the quality of the outcome device would be as well as we imagined. So. Um, I think quantifying the quality of graphene seems um, one of the crucial tasks in, in the, the developments. So um, how to quantify the quality of graphene? Um, I think the metrology system so far, um, what's the limitation and what kind of metrology you usually use to um, quantify the quality of graphene? So far, it, because in my opinion, like if you use uh, X-ray diffraction, the if it's uh, because um, the layer, if it's single layer itself, it's difficult to get um, the OO2 diffraction. And with Raman spectroscopy, it would be difficult for um, large scale mapping as well. So um, I'm wondering, and TEM, TEM it would be um, very time consuming. So I'm wondering what kind of technique um, is available today to make um, large scale quantitative research. On so on one hand, keep it uniform. On the other, how to what metrology tools do you need to make sure it's mm. uniform? Cedric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an extremely good question, and it's also something that we are developing because we we indeed we we are encountering these problems. Uh, for graphene, well, we, we are we are still using a lot of Raman because um, um, Raman is 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 giving a lot of information on graphene. Yeah. Um, you have the defect peak, you have doping levels, you have... So, so Raman is, is a quite complete uh, technique. And well, I'm also happy to tell you that two days you can have uh, 300 millimeter Raman tools that have been developed and that are mm -hmm. on the market. So, so in that sense, it's, um, it's, it's an important step. Um, there is also other technology that has been developed. Um, uh, terahertz time domain spectroscopy is now coming up um, where uh, you can have uh, by uh, yeah, looking to the reflection and then, then you can uh, by, by doing some calculation based on the through the uh, uh, mobility theory and so on, you can you can, have a kind of uh, sheet resistance and then a mobility number that comes out and this seems to correspond relatively well it's a it's a kind of electrical way to look into the material so it's not it's not direct um mm -hmm. so this is also something that that uh, that is important I, I can tell you that we also when we after a transfer when tool when, when graphene comes in in in, um, in 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 our fab we also have a lot of automated uh, SEM and, and uh, images that are, and defect uh, 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 follow-up technologies, uh, because while we are doing a lot of litho and, and there typically to, to look into defects, of course we have much more defects, but we categorize the defects. We have an idea about the amount of defects that we have. Um, these are mainly wrinkles and bilayer spots. 
Um, but but also there, well, we, we can see and follow up and, and see how we can improve that. For the companies in Epic who, who have metrology solutions, what is your item in the Santa Claus Christmas list? What would you want from them, Cedric? Uh, what I want from them is, is um, yeah, faster uh, um, uh, Raman over full wafer. <laughs> <laughs> That would be great. Um, um, there is also, well, we, we see that if, if you look to graphene, that's, that's one of the problems. But, but for example, um, for TMDCs, so, mm -hmm. so the other, the molydisulfides and the tungsten disulfides of this world, um, and the, the problems are even more challenging because, for example, uh, terahertz time domain spectroscopy doesn't work. So, so there we have basically only photoluminescence that we are using, uh, but, but then um, um, let's say ultra low temperature or, or um, um, yeah cryogenic uh, temperature uh, uh, photoluminescence, uh, because then you start to see the effectivity peaks popping up, uh, which is kind of very interesting for us, uh, and we try to correlate that um, with that. But all kind of uh, light-based spectroscopies. I think there is there is a lot of publications out there. I think we need some creativity, and and I'm pretty sure that we can use other other ways to to characterize also. Um, so so I'm, I'm I'm I think there will be a lot of evolution coming up in the representing in the, the metrology companies in Epic. Cedric, this is where the magic of Epic happens. You ask and I deliver. Marcello <laughs> Binetti from Lightec. Uh, you you heard the challenge from Cedric. What's on your mind? Yeah, uh, I hope you you can hear me. And uh, Loud and first clear. of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's very it's really great to be able to have such kind of meeting with all of you. And um, yeah, well, the first question that would pop up to my mind with Cedric uh, um, uh, remark about uh, fast Raman would be how fast should it be, and uh, also. Um, on a different, on a slightly different topic, what is the um, critical size of the of the say investigation spot that they, they that you're interested in, like which probably would correlate with the dimension of the of the device that you're looking at. Um, yes, but but we are looking to very different types of of devices. So for but but let's say one micron would be already a good start. Um, and then we would like to have, let's say, yeah, 400 spots done in, in about one hour or something like that, because then, then it starts to become realistic to do a, um, um, yeah, well, to, to do a mapping of a wafer. Of course, you don't have all the, the details, but at least it will give you an idea about uniformity, uh, statistically relevant. And then you can start to build from there and, and see how you can improve that statistically by, by processing, by improving your processes and so on. This is how we are doing it uh, today for most of the, uh, yeah, for most of the things, even thickness measurements and so on are done 49 points or, or, or maybe, uh, yeah, 400 points depends a little bit. Um, when we are doing TXRF, for example, it's the same. It's, it's about 400 points uh, distributed over a, over a 300 millimeter wafer that the, they are slightly bigger and so on. But yeah, um, typically a, a full wafer mapping cannot last longer than one hour. This is already very long. Yeah, okay, that's because uh, maybe I will get back to you uh, later offline because uh, we are doing some development work in the in the direction on the on Raman, trying to get a little faster and to cover a little more area. But maybe we have to uh, we can discuss the the details and see. If um, yeah, if we can come up to some common kind of common ground. Marcello, yeah. grazie mille, Cedric. The, the, thank you. Well, we say the Netherlands a bit different there. I know Cedric, but thank you so much for that. I I want to uh, now before we go to the company with the bigger spectral range in the S weird detectors, uh, Emberion. I want to bring to the discussion two companies who are making a difference in the graphene sector. One of them as a developer and the other one as a user. First, the company Atrago, who is making graphene mains based solution for for. I have here the CEO of uh, Atrago, Santiago Jose, who is going to tell us about what they use MEMS, MEMS for in the graphene technology. Thank you, Jose. And uh, yes, uh, we use graphene 
MEMS for this place. So projectors, yeah. For video projectors and for uh, any kind of displays that uh, can be uh, reflective type of displays. So focusing on HUD solutions and uh, AR, VR uh, right now, but in principle not limited to, to those uh, uh, sectors. Um, yeah, we have a Graphene MEMS technology and uh, uh, as you all know, uh, Graphene has uh, excellent mechanical properties and those are precisely the ones that we are most interested in. Um, so something that I wanted to ask and add to the discussion is um, my, maybe as a, as a yeah, company in the middle, uh, why there is so much uh, effort in the electrical characterization and sometimes we forgot uh, about the, the mechanical characterization. I understand that there are some, some uh, applications that require higher electrical mobility and the uh, Raman, for example, will be an excellent uh, tool for uh, also discovering defects. But uh, yeah, some, somehow I was wondering, maybe, maybe the question is for Cedric. Definitely for Cedric. <laughs> I, I say that because I make it very strong in MEMS as well. Cedric, what's on your mind? Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, first of all, uh, the, the disclaimer is that we are not looking into graphene for MEMS application at this moment in time. I'm following the work that uh, Peter Steineken and, and co are doing. So most of you will know these people uh, from TU Delft. Um, um, we, we, are, yeah, we are mainly focused on, on the electrical property, properties of graphene, but, but um, nevertheless, during the transfer process, when, when we are yeah, manipulating the graphene and so on, we start to look very carefully to, to, uh, to, to how it behaves mechanically and so on. Um, and there we see very interesting things. Is, is there, there is a lot of correlation with the quality of the material and, and how it behaves uh, on, when you manipulate it on larger scale. Um, especially if you, you grow very high quality material, there is, um, there is, there is uh, a lot of challenge, but also a lot of opportunity there. Um, but, but honestly, I'm, yeah, we, we are always looking a little bit in, in, in the way, yeah, to the electrical performance, because that's what, what matters for our kind of device at the end of the, of the day. Yeah. We also have in the room, Santiago, I'm going to come to you later after the presentation from CanGraphic, but before we also have in the room, uh, the company Biosense, Valerie Cervesov, thank you very much for being with us today, Valerie. Are you with us? because we have some problems with the connection. Valerie, I will come back to you in a second. Uh, Valerie is uh, developing a startup for cancer diagnosis. He needs ultra, ultra high accuracy on the detection of photons in the SW range. And that is the best possible introduction to the company I'm gonna come to bring to the room now. We go all the way to Finland. We, we want large spectral range at the price or lower than Indian Gallium Arsenide. That what, there's a company making it happen already. We go to Emberion, Tapani Rihanen. Thank you so much for being with us. It was our first graphene meeting. We had to give you the right spotlight. Thank you for taking the lead in bringing s cameras with graphene to the market. The floor is yours. Tapani? Yep. Yes. Stop with the sharing. Just a second. Okay. Perfect. Very good. <clears throat> okay, and uh, nice to uh, be present in the meeting. Th very, uh, thank you very much for in inviting us to, to this uh, very interesting uh, meeting. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, 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 presenting one particular case where graphene makes sense. And uh, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, so that there, please uh, be patient when uh, I'm coming to the graphene at some point of the, of the story. story. Uh, well, uh, talking about Emberion first, so that Emberion is a company that was established 2016 as a spin-out company, spin-off company from uh, Nokia. Uh, Nokia's uh, research activities that they were running that on that time, both in the UK and in, in Finland. And we, we uh, created a company that uh, from the very beginning started focusing on, on uh, developing uh, image sensors and, uh, and camera solutions that are based on different nanomaterial solutions. 
We have currently uh, uh, 32 em employees. We work in, in these two different sites. We have a photosensitive layer uh, material development there in, in UK, in Cambridge uh, Science Park. And we have then the uh, uh, rest of the team in, in Finland, in Espo, uh, in Finland, we are doing uh, readout IC development, electronics de development, software development. And we are also then taking care of the camera assembly testing and calibration in, in production, production uh, uh, sense. Uh, we have been uh, members of Graphene Flagship uh, from the very beginning of, of the whole, whole activity, activity even before the Graphene Flagship was established there as a part of the Nokia team that time, naturally. naturally. So that there from, uh, from that perspective, it, I have had a honor to really follow follow the uh, throughout the, what the graphene flagship has been able to able to create and and i'm, I'm really proud of, of the different activities what are running at the moment and especially this what there what there is related to what shedrick was already already uh, uh, talking about the capability of uh, taking graphene to uh, to uh, towards uh, full full-scale cmos integration in the uh, gra uh, in the graphene flagship uh, to the experimental pilot line what uh, cedric is uh, is leading so it's it's really one of the key key activities what will enable uh, things what i'm, I'm going to so soon talk talk about okay uh, a little bit about our cameras uh, first of all so that i need to make this type of disclaimer that all what we do co in commercial sense is not based on graphene so graphene is not the, the only material the only core uh, competence for what we are we are doing so so we are uh, starting from uh, nanomaterial several different nanomaterials in our portfolio the core thing what we may be use in our devices are colloidal quantum dots what are creating the photo uh, uh, photo response uh, what are, uh, what are, what is the absorber for 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 our 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 devices and then we use graphene for enhancing some uh, some uh, some of the properties what I'm soon going to talk about. Uh, so core, core uh, thing in, in when looking at our, our, our devices and their performance. So first of all, so that there we get this very broad wavelength range, what is very unique uh, and uh, there's not there, not many, many uh, competing, uh, competing technologies, technology that can do the same. They are some companies working on graphene, uh, color quantum dots uh, actually even the same, but, but uh, this is very, really a unique, unique, uh, unique uh, property. Secondly, we get the very low noise. We get very large dynamic range that there, that there's a picture here in in the in uh, in in, um, in my slide. What is uh, telling telling about uh, about that? Uh, it's taken with the full full 400 to 2000 uh, nanometer uh, meter meter uh, uh, range. But um, if you compare would compare this image to uh, to the picture taken by in gas in gas camera, so you would not get that dynamic range what we have in that in that image. Good. Okay. So very uh, interesting, interesting technology and uh, core element. What we do. So we start from CMOS, uh, CMOS uh, design. We design the device. There's a couple of uh, readout ICs here. Here, we work in eight-inch uh, wafer scale, uh, creating all the complexity of the image sensor in in uh, in the read uh, in the CMOS CMOS platform. After that, what we do. Let's go. You know, go actually. Oh, oh, actually, I keep still here. We planarize the wafer. We do the post processing of the wafer. Wafer uh, if, if using also some partners' uh, capabilities abilities to do do that. And after we have the planarized wafer, then we start adding these uh, these new materials, nanomaterials on top top of it. And finally, we planarize. Uh, finally, we encapsulate the device using ALD technology. So uh, what is our solution? Uh, so it's based on colloidal quantum dot, dot, dots, as I, I, I mentioned. We use also a new type of a, type of a readout IC, what we have de developed for completely from scratch. We can uh, have have the measurement in in a couple of different uh, different uh, measurement modes. We can measure it in open circuit voltage mode. We can measure it in a in a in a standard uh, charge collecting uh, reverse bias uh, mode mode. Uh, what is unique here so that first of all so that we can we can first of all uh, do 
devices in a very scalable way. We can scale the pixel size. This is one of the one of the very in interesting things. Both graphene and colloidal quantum dot solutions. We can scale them in in a from submicron to 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 very large pixels, pixels, pixels. So that the the scalability is one of the things. Secondly, using colloidal quantum dot solutions, we we, we have get this uh, to a very uh, kind of a adjustable uh, spectral range. And finally, we have created uh, manufacturing solutions that are really scalable uh, in the sense that we only use thin film and wet chemistry processes that are typical for, for semiconductor conductor in, in dust, industries. Good. Okay, then I can come to this uh, core point of uh, this. So why graphene? What is the interest in graph graphene? And, uh, and uh, we have here uh, first of all the image of, uh, of the of the stack how we built it so on top of the readout ic we have their uh, bottom electrode dielectric graphene then we create the colloidal quantum dot layer layer and encapsulation on top of that couple of couple of things about why is it so interesting first of all so that in doing it in this way we create a new type of interface new type of junction graphene uh, that is a semi metal semi metal to semiconductor interface that is type of a schottky barrier but there but a couple of interesting in, uh, properties it's tunable uh, its barrier barrier height can be tuned secondly it uh, uh, this uh, uh, a barrier. Uh, this uh, junction has very low reverse saturation current, owing to finite density of, of uh, charge carriers in in, uh, in in graphene. So we can enhance the uh, noise performance in uh, lower the uh, dark dark current current of the of the photo photodiode. We have developed several different architectures. It's it's uh, and uh, we have been able to also patent several of these these uh, these structures. And uh, uh, we have now a very uh, in interesting uh, collaborations what are, are looking beyond what we do today together with the partners in, in Graphene Flagship. We work with, uh, with uh, uh, this uh, 2D experimental pilot line, especially via uh, Finnish uh, VTT. Uh, we have, uh, we work with Grafenia, we work with uh, with uh, Cambridge uh, University uh, Graphene, Re uh, Graphene uh, Center and, and, and so on, so that we have a very good uh, set of uh, partners with whom we are we are working working. And what we try to do in, in this range is taking us to to even even further. In able we, we we are working currently in 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 integrating visible sphere and midwave infrared into one image sensor and that is uh, going to be something what is really really unique uh, really uh, something what there uh, is not possible possible uh, with uh, many means uh, I, I think that in this uh, integration what we can do in enabled by graphene is something something what there what there really makes 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 difference okay so i'm, I'm just uh, concluding my talk here and uh, uh, say, saying that we are really excited to work with a combination of colloidal quantum dots and graphene to create novel new type of a, a type of a phot photonic devices and uh, we are working uh, based on on optimized measurement principles and readout ICs that are uh, are really tailored for for the requirements of, of these uh, nanomaterials graphene and colloidal quantum dots and what we already achieved today is is quite uh, uh, interesting uh, from commercial perspective so please visit our our web, web pages you find much much more information there about our current current products and here just there this typical picture about the sphere uh, manufacturer so looking through silicon wafer with your with your camera camera so that is something what there uh, I didn't talk so much about here the application. So a lot of different industrial industrial applications what they are targeting too. Thank you very much, Tapani. It was really, really great seeing you and your team at the at the vision show in Stuttgart. And there we had a discussion about the comparison between graphene and Indian Galleon Arsenide cameras today and tomorrow. And we had a quick discussion about price. And you seem, uh, some people on your team also seem quite convinced that, the, that it could be cheaper to make in the future a sweet cameras with graphene that are lower cost than Indian Galleon Arsenide. Could you share a bit of vision on that? Yeah, so first of all, so that there, 
if thinking about the manufacturing process so that there and comparison to uh, indium gallium arsenide or uh, three, three, five uh, semiconductor based uh, devices. So what we are talking about here, so we are starting from standard CMOS uh, processes. So standard eight inch CMOS, CMOS wafer. We do post processing of the wafer so that there that is uh, planarization and uh, chains of metallization uh, regarding, uh, well, to, there were already a question about, about that. But then uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, then uh, there's a, some complexity in, in transferring the graphene on top of the of the wafers, but all all is somehow monolithical integration layer by layer on top of uh, CMOS, and you could uh, maybe think about uh, uh, this core structure also from the perspective that there none of these uh, uh, steps what we do after after the CMOS CMOS process is is more expensive than than the CMOS. CMOS processing itself, uh, uh, all the lithographic steps, what you have in the CMOS process itself, itself. how many CMOS uh, steps there are, they are in, in, a, in the current process, maybe roughly 30. 30 uh, we add there uh, some, uh, some uh, five more. So that there, this, uh, from this basis, you can, you can think about what the cost, cost structure can be when these te technologies are mature and in, in volumes. Today it's it's much more expensive. Uh, just to say that uh, we are we are still still doing quite quite many of the, the steps quite manually related to graphene integration and uh, and, and so. Okay, so for me, the, there is one thing that you bring to the to the table, which is very important. Until now, most of the detectors are thinking about making them more efficient. You are the first one who is saying, or oh, making them cheaper, and most important, the high spectral range. And that is something that is going to bring a lot of interest to this technology, especially, I believe, in hyperspectral imaging. We have two people who I want you to interact. But before that, I want to ask you, is there any particular met needs when it comes to thin film technology or coatings for uh, graphene detectors? Well, we are interested to talk uh, talk about uh, different uh, different uh, naturally uh, thin film technologies, different filter filtered technologies. Uh, uh, we are also interested about talking about different uh, photonic uh, component packaging or image sensor packaging uh, uh, and uh, issues. There are many different uh, things that there that we are we are really uh, looking for. Uh, uh, solutions beyond what we do today, so that they're... Uh... That, that's good, because all the way from Plymouth in the UK, I had the company Artemis Optical represent today the companies in the thin film and coatings for, for optics. Stuart Allen, good afternoon. Stuart Allen from Artemis, he's trying to unmute. Stuart... Hello, one, two, three, one, two, three. I will come back to you after the presentation from Can Graphic after this. But we also have Atrago Santiago Jose. What's on your mind? Yes, uh, I, I wanted to add to the discussion of the price of graphene. Uh, well, the price of a product uh, using graphene, integrating graphene. Uh, what uh, Tapani said uh, uh, that uh, any process uh, uh, is conventional and therefore the costs should be not different than the other uh, products. But uh, then we have a price of graphene that is about uh, 15,000 euro per square meter. Uh, what volumes do you expect to, 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 or what do you need to actually reach a competitive product that is uh, integrating graphene in the sense of your particular product uh, in Attenberion? At, at already at this point of the time, so that I, I think that there, uh, when thinking about the cost structure of this type of uh, technolo technology, what we are developing, so uh, pr price price of graphene is is uh, not uh, something what uh, would would make make this uh, this uh, uh, dif difficult. There, I, I think that their core issue is to get their 
really a, a, a reliable, repeatable uh, eight-inch in, uh, wafer scale process in place. And, and I, I'm really hopeful that that happen, happens via these ac big activities, what I already mentioned, mentioned and what Cedric has been uh, talk, talking about as well, so that there, and others, others here as well, that, that, that is maybe the core, core thing that there, that it's, it's uh, price is not there, not there currently, currently the thing what we need to, need to look at there. Uh, it's more more about the reliability and um, and way way how to how to uh, how to uh, how to scale, but but uh, and uh, calculations what we have made uh, together with uh, with the uh, graphene uh, CVD graphene uh, man manufacturers in in some of the joint projects so tells that they're that really really uh, graphene production in uh, in this scale what they're what we are talking about here is. Is not it's not going to differ very much. It's going to be maybe one of the most expensive process steps there, but there, but not really really far from what I was I was saying. Maybe Cedric uh, can uh, can uh, add, add a comment on this one so that there. Uh, you... Yeah, well, I, I think the, the today already you can well graphene is you you can buy graphene. Um, at relatively cheap prices from, from several uh, vendors. But of course, the, the, there is a big difference between uh, quality differences. And, and I think we will expect even bigger differences at the moment we can transfer better. One of the big questions, and, and I don't know what it will be, if, if we will have graphene supplied by companies, uh, so, so a little bit like you have SOI wafers that are um, supplied by companies, or if the interface control and so on will need to have graphene in-house in the foundries. Uh, this, this is not completely clear, but I think there, um, well, both approaches can have advantages uh, in that sense that, that uh, towards downscaling the price, if you have somebody who is very focused on, on only producing that he can he can most probably uh, um, downscaling the price even more. I think uh, I, I don't know if they're still online, but uh, applied nanolayers was was online also, but but I don't think they're still online. Yeah, they are. But they are, but but they also have. Uh, um, well, they they are having that model that they would like to be the the yeah you know the people that that are doing the graphene transfer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we, we need to improve the, the quality and then we can see what it will cost. Um, today, it's, it's very difficult to have a, um, a very specific vision on, on what will be the cost. But I, I think at the end, it's always possible to, to, uh, to lower the cost if you go to mass production, especially if you, go, if you can control very well. Um, there are several ways to design reactors in such a way that, that, that yeah, basically you can, you can go fast and, and so on. So, so I'm relatively optimistic, but we still need to find the way for upscaling. And this is what we are working on now. Thank you very much, Cedric. And Santiago, I don't want to comment on this 15K per square meter because I have in the room iMac, Embarion, Camp Graphic, and Paragraph, so I can get in serious trouble and my daughter needs me to keep this job. But uh, we want to continue well with the program and I want to go now to Pisa. I want to go to Pisa because this is one of the most exciting things that have happened to me. I am a very big fan of the Infotech Center. And when they told me that Infotech is now really going to focus on helping can graphic developing photonic integrated circuit-based graphene technologies, I couldn't get more excited. Going to the city of the tower, going to Pisa and meeting, of course, Alessio Pirastu. Alessio, grazie mille. It's an honor to have you here. You are the fourth speaker, but I expect a big, big round of discussion after your presentation. Thanks, Jose, for the enthusiastic introduction. Uh, one day you should tell me what kind of coffee you drink, usually, because it uh, looks very good. <laughs> so let me share. And tell me if you can see my my screen. I can see it, go slideshow mode and Lavazza, but, um, but there are better ones. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you see now? 
No, not yet. You need to go to slideshow mode, bottom left. Yes, now it's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, uh, CanGraphic as a, a new entity in this uh, uh, graphene panorama. So CanGraphic mission is to improve uh, uh, optical communication in the 5G environments and data centers. So we developed the Graphene Integrated Photonics or GIP, how we call it, uh, to enable next generation optical transceivers to support increasing data traffic. Uh, a few words about our history. Uh, CanGraphic was established as spin-off of the Cambridge University in 2018. And in 2019, uh, we opened the uh, subsidiary in Italy, in Pisa in particular, to overtake all the R&D activities. And in April 2021, as you said, uh, Jose, uh, CanGraphic uh, uh, started to manage the infrastructure infotech of the Santana School. So basically uh, today, CanGraphic is the only uh, manager of this infrastructure. Uh, I will talk about it later on. Uh, now a few words about applications. As I said, uh, CanGraphic operates in the optical telecommunication fields in order to provide solution to the increasing demand of bandwidth. So we are talking about data traffic. So all the indicators tell us that uh, the global data traffic is increasing at fast uh, pace, uh, led by applications like uh, ultra high quality video, uh, networking, internet of things and cloud services. You can see a few numbers here from Cisco uh, that tell us that uh, uh, the industry is looking for next generation transceivers in order to satisfy this uh, 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 growth in uh, data traffic. And we know also after the pandemic events that uh, uh, actually this uh, problem is becoming very, very uh, urgent now because everyone is using, as we are doing now, uh, uh, remote uh, working uh, via um, all these uh, application softwares. So uh, we aim to provide solutions to this uh, uh, fast growing, I would say exponential growing uh, growth of the data traffic. In particular, we are focused on data centers and 5G infrastructures because we believe and uh, all the indicators, as I said, are in, in agreement that uh, uh, new semiconductor photonic components are needed to uh, process uh, data and to transmit data in a massive, massive way. Um, current technologies like uh, silicon photonics and indium phosphide are going to have uh, some difficulties, uh, maybe not now, but uh, I would say in the midterm, three, four years from now, uh, in, par in particular about uh, performance and scalability. So a new scalable technology is needed to fulfill these needs, uh, and in particular, to uh, be able to provide higher speed, lower cost, lower power consumption, and uh, ability to operate in a broader temperature range. We are talking about 5G, for example, outdoor is one of the keywords of this uh, particular field. So we aim to, uh, thanks to the, our platform, to satisfy the industry needs. A few words about the technology. We know already about Graphene, uh, is already established as R&D and the development uh, uh, by the flagship and uh, several companies. Uh, it's a 2D material uh, made of single uh, layer of carbon atoms, and it shows very, very nice properties. In particular, uh, we already mentioned high mobility and uh, um, uh, resilience to high temperature, for example. And this is uh, the core fact to enable next generation optical devices, such as modulators and photodetector. So we are targeting uh, new optical lanes um, able to transmit 100 gigabit per second or more by using uh, on-off king uh, modulation format or even 200 gigabit per second by using more complex modula modulation formats. And so we are going to develop electro-optical engines for short reach application. Electro-optical engine is uh, the semiconductor, the, the, the PIC, so the photonic integrated circuit together with electronics in order to support this application. Uh, graphene is uh, synthesized through the chemical vapor deposition process. Um, for example, we use, uh, uh, we are approaching the single crystal approach, but also the continuous film format uh, can be uh, one of the good candidates for our applications. And graphene is a scalable technology, can be produced uh, from uh, abundant materials. Um, so we know that the wafer level uh, uh, scalability is something that we are facing now, and it's, it's going to be very important for um, to, in order to deploy this uh, um, technology. 
by the way, just to answer or to enter in, uh, uh, in the topic that we, you discussed before, um, for the optical telecommunication field, the cost is not more, it is related to the scalability, of course, but it is also related to another metric. The metric is a gigabit, so dollar per gigabit per second. So by increasing the speed, even if the cost of the platform is going to be the same as for silicon photonics, there will be an advantage because the, uh, the dollar per gigabit metric is going to uh, give a favorable um, solution. And then of course, we already discussed about the graphene uh, transfer and encapsulation process on silicon. We call this graphene enhanced silicon photonics because the ingredient, the graphene ingredient is going to uh, bring uh, all of these uh, properties in order to enable this category of projects. So I have summarized the benefits of graphene in four pillars. Uh, the first one is for sure the high bandwidth density and important keywords for the telecom industry. So uh, everything must be small and everything must be fast. This in order to uh, integrate more and more optical lanes, for example, in a single chip in order to increase the, the bandwidth density. Low cost, um, wafer level, we already talked about that. Uh, this is a challenge, but uh, it is uh, for sure one of the most promising properties of uh, the technology uh, and no complex uh, fabrication process. So as we said, graphene can be transferred uh, through a transfer process, which basically is a kind of printing process. Um, and can graphic is developed in our, uh, its own process to do it. Um, very important. Uh, so the graphene is a temperature resi resilient, so means that can operate at higher temperature with respect to the standard technologies. So we are targeting, targeting to operate above 110 degrees C's, which is the requirement for the outdoor application uh, in a 5G environment, for example, without thermoelectric coolers or expensive uh, cooling systems, which are impacting the power consumption. So also the lower uh, signals um, will allow to have uh, a low power dissipation electronics, which uh, put together with graphene will lead to a lower power consumption. And uh, the fourth one is the uh, wavelength agnostic property of graphene, which means that we can operate uh, with the same design at all uh, uh, wavelengths, telecom wavelengths, even more for other applications uh, with the same design, which means that we can fit many more optical lanes in, this, in single chip, and this will increase uh, uh, the uh, traffic capacity per device. So this is uh, what we are going to do uh, as can graphic. A few words about Infotech facility. As uh, Jose said before, can graphic is now managing the facility as a single manager, and we provide front-end and back-end uh, technologies, technology services to industry R&D centers and universities. So the, the facility includes uh, uh, a 50, uh, 550 uh, square meters clean room area with 10 high skilled people. And of course, this is going to be our R&D facility for graphene. But again, we also provide technology services for uh, the community. Uh, here, a list of platforms that are available at Infotech, for sure, graphene photonics. So we are planning to do the synthesis of graphene, uh, transfer process, encapsulation process. Uh, silicon photonics, which is uh, a, a part of the equation, of course. So we do passive uh, uh, fabric device fabrication on six inch wafers. Uh, we have the glass and nitride uh, platform, the hybrid integration, lithium niobate, and advanced packaging, which is critical in order to uh, make these uh, devices real. So we also have this uh, capability. So beside the graphene, uh, our own activities on graphene, we offer such kind of services for the community. So fast prototyping and R&D services. And now a couple of slides listing what we need uh, as company, because this is actually the topic of, uh, of this meeting. So first of all, I would like to focus on uh, the uh, new technology introduction path. Uh, we know, uh, we agree, all agree that graphene is in its uh, early development, but in, 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 um, in the industrial sense, uh, but we need uh, uh, to discuss with uh, uh, the community in order to define what are the, the right paths in order to speed up the introduction of the technology. So I'm thinking about uh, performance validation. So what kind of uh, uh, path we have to put in place with our partners in order to speed up this uh, process. Technology validation, 
and of course, qualification beyond, beyond the telcordian and mill standards. So this is very important because uh, I have experience in a technology introduction uh, when I was working uh, in other lives. And this is uh, very often is very painful. So we need to be prepared and uh, to know what to do in order to satisfy our customers and to uh, make this uh, uh, graphene technology real for the industry. And the second one we discussed a lot about this is about scaling up and manufacturing. So we, we, we know that uh, we need to establish an industrial ecosystem in order to uh, uh, go to manufacturing. So the first one is uh, start. let's start to talk. <laughs> the ecosystem is very important. EPIC can give a, a big contribution on this. Um, and we need to, uh, for sure, uh, define together or with the partners, um, what can be done in uh, existing CMOS compatible fabs? So PDKs uh, for monolithic integration of uh, CMOS electronics uh, with graphene-based photonics, this will be the dream. So a single uh, monolithic integration, but how many problems? We have to know the problems. In particular, uh, uh, how to produce high quality graphene. So how to contain the cross contamination, how to study the scalability and cost associated to this uh, uh, platform. And of course, the, the wish list is completed with uh, uh, the possibility to implement several fabrication solutions. For example, continuous film uh, graphene or single crystal graphene uh, in order to enable several or multiple technical solutions in case we need it. As, again, uh, for the telecom products, uh, the quality is the king and then re reliability. So we need to address with the community all of these uh, topics or points that I listed here, but I'm sure there will be even more. So thank you very much for your attention. My contacts are here and uh, uh, let's go for a, an open discussion. Thank you very much. As you can see, we are building the graphene, the graphene community. Um, we are bringing around our four uh, starting members of this technology. Alessio, I'm gonna ask you something publicly. I would like to have a meeting in Pisa, at uh, the Infotech next to the School of Santana. I know you have a really nice venue there and bring the graphene companies of Europe there to discuss potential cooperations. You think that could happen? That would be great. We're uh, gonna do it. But now I want to ask you- It's a fantastic city, so you can enjoy also the city. And the food oh, and the coffee and the company, but most important, the business. And I love what the way the way that Infotech has pushed for this. We need this to happen in Europe and great, it's great that it's happening with you. Alessio, I have a few people I want to introduce you. The first one is a photonic integrated circuit company that is actually developing a platform based on PLC, on, on silicon oxide. We have the company uh, in the room, we have the company in the room, has team photonics in the room, Adrian Villat. Adrian, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So what, what's in your mind when you hear that, they, that Infotech now fully focus on graphene and the fully focus on graphene for silicon photonics and the end for high bandwidth and the end for low cost and very good detectors? What kind of room for cooperation do you observe? Jose, Jose sorry. Can Graphic is focused on this. Infotech is our facility, but Can Graphic is focused on graphene. Sorry. I, I deeply it. apologize. Yes. <laughs> Can Graphic, I'm sorry. Adrian, what's in your mind? Well, that's that's anyway very interesting because, uh, so you're right, we make PLCs, customized uh, PLC components on pure silica wafers. Um, and of course, we're more focusing on passive functions like biosense. So when we hear of this, I would say extra. Uh, layers, extra uh, processes. Um, of course, that really um, raises our curiosity to, to add probably active functions like detection and modulation on glass. So I would say at this stage, we're a little bit of an outsider, but we could offer two things. So one is uh, a standard, like we have this uh, coupling solution for silicon photonic platforms, you know, to make the coupling to optical fibers um, more uh, easy, packaging easier as well. So that's one thing if you work on this uh, on this substrate, I would say. The other one is um, probably we can provide um, glass-based waveguide components to test graphene layers. I don't know if it makes sense in production. Well, silica is very good for RF as far as I know, but we could also provide you know components for, for cheap testing, like um, test because you can use transfer printing and so on, and to make uh, the testing iterations uh, much cheaper and faster than with silicon photonics eventually. Well, yes. I think, Alessio, it is very important to consider here, PLC technology can be very, very 
uh, affordable, I don't want to say the word low cost, but very affordable, has extremely low propagation losses. And this, as Adrian told you, is very good for coupling from fiber to cheap as an interposer. But one thing, one problem that we have with photonic integrated circuit is we need very, very high efficient detectors. Very high efficient detectors. You are claiming in your slide that you can make very efficient detectors, even unbiased detectors, uh, and, and very, with very low noise. Uh, how fast and how low? How soon can we have this for the photonic integrated circuit community? Alessio. Okay, so uh, good question. So for sure, the detection uh, section of uh, our uh, our work is uh, is uh, is very challenging. So there are several solutions in order to increase uh, uh, the efficiency by using different physical um, phenomena um, with the graphene. So we are now working on it in order to improve. Uh, so the efficiency, so the responsivity, for example. And uh, in particular, we are working hard in order to increase the efficiency by uh, making the interaction of the graphene with the waveguide even more effective. So it's a kind of design aspect together with the process aspect that we put in place. Uh, I cannot say much now, but we are working uh, in order to establish these uh, uh, new concepts. In terms of timing, I think, uh, uh, but this is for, you know, uh, I mean, for the telecom uh, telecommunication platform, I think we must be ready in uh, two, three years from now uh, with uh, demonstrators and solid uh, understanding of the devices in order to start then the introduction, the real introduction of the products in the market. So as I said before, the industry is not looking for a new solution right now. It's impossible basically to guarantee very high performance based on graphene now, but uh, we have to work hard in order to meet the uh, next deadline, which will be, will be in uh, three years or so uh, for you know, new applications or new architecture for example, the co-package optics for data centers. And yes. as I mentioned before, also the data processing, uh, intra-antenna data processing in 5G environments. So this is more or less the time frame. The same question for Oli from Paragraph and Cedric from IME Graphene. Uh, we have the representing the photonic integrated circuit companies in Epic. We have Team Photonics in the room. And Team Photonics is thinking, I want to add Graphene to my platform and I provide PLC manufacturing to my clients, is, will that be possible? And if so, by when can have a company like Team Photonics integrating photodiodes as a building block based on graphene? I don't know if maybe, maybe Oli wants to address it yeah. first and then Cedric. So um, you, know, you can, what's nice is you can start working day on this, right? Um, we have tools, and we have materials on site that allow you to start investigating this um, this afternoon. You want? So, so uh, Adrian, we can send um, a wafer to, to, to the United Kingdom and they will uh, test it. Uh, Cedric, could you comment on the on graphene on glass? It got, has it been tried, tested? Is there any work on that? Um, well, <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Yes, in that sense that, uh, yeah, most of the graphene is, is transferred to silicon oxide, which is nothing else than glass. So, so the, the transition from graphene to, yeah, should, to, to glass should be easy. The only thing is it's, it's not so common because it's, it's not visible. The other problem that you have is um, processing in fabs on glass is not uh, very standard because um, well, it, it's changing, but, but a lot of tools do not handle glass wafers because they're transparent and they have sensors that are reading out if the wafer is in and so on. So, so it's a little bit complex to just enter with, uh, uh, with glass wafers in, in a standard semiconductor uh, environment. But there are tricks to solve that. So, so theoretically, it should be doable. Um, so, so, and especially if you think about just transferring the graphene on, on a glass wafer or transferring the graphene on a silicon wafer, honestly, I don't see a big difference. So if you if you have it developed for a silicon wafer, you can have it developed uh, for a glass wafer too. So so in that sense, I think there are opportunities there. Uh, and Tapani from Emberi wants to comment on this. What's on your oh, mind? 
Maybe just uh, continuing what uh, Cedric said, so that there, there has been quite a lot of studies on, on how to integrate graphene also on polymer substrates and, and flexible substrates and, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> I think that this is one of the great things uh, here, that there, it is a material that really scale to, uh, to different type of, uh, type of uh, use cases. And, uh, for example, in uh, photonics optic uh, sensor uh, sensor area, so it's very interesting to look at what could be done in a large scale integration, integration at some point point of the time, and and especially this type of a, uh, pho uh, uh, photo sensor uh, sensors uh, made on on uh, flexible substrates for applications like health health uh, fitness whatever ever. No, you took the, 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 the voice. I have a question in YouTube just for you. A question is coming from Sumitomo Electric. Uh, Yoshiaki Shikata-san has something in mind. He's wondering, is this SWIR image sensor that you presented cooled or uncooled? So uh, we are, the, currently we are not uh, really talking about cooling. We are, we are talking about temperature stabilization. We are typically using the device at uh, roughly uh, five five degrees of Celsius, Celsius, so that there. But it is a temperature where we stabilize stabilize the device for for to getting better better noise performance. But there, but it's it, we are, we don't need to really cool cool down to uh, very low low temp temperatures. You talk about five five degrees, so that's that's still. You, I, I can see that we don't call that cooling, but we call it temperature control. Correct. Yes. Uh, I want to go now from where we are uh, to the geographical center of Europe. I want to go to Vilnius, Lithuania. Romualda Strusovas, thank you very much for joining the meeting. You have heard so far. Uh, the different activities from IMEC, from Paragraph, from CanGraphic, how we are actually combining all this the success story of Emberion. What's on your mind after this meeting? What kind of cooperations can we do now? Hello, thank you for the introduction. So, yes, I got nice technologies and applications for graphene, and uh, my experience is uh, scaling graphene from uh, other point of view. We work on uh, laser induced graphene. So we have te developed technology of uh, graphene oxide reduction to induce graphene to make it uh, and, uh, a, condu a conductor or uh, inducing graphene from uh, polymers like polyamide. And also now we're planning to start research to induce molyb molybdenum disulfide from uh, also chemical precursors. So we're working on uh, this aspect, how to produce graphene with laser, but and and also I think it could be interesting for applications, as I mentioned before, or for flexible electronics, for example, for flexible sensors, because we can induce uh, graphene on a flexible polymer, and we don't need it to transfer from silicon. Thank you very much, Acho Romualdas, and I, I, it's good that you are really setting up so many different cooperations. I, I also want to go to Graz, to Graz, because they have, we, there we had the Joanneum Center. Reinhardt, thank you very much for joining the meeting. I know that your, your interest is on, well, you tell us what is your interest on graphene technologies and tell us how we can help you maybe on the field of inject printing, which I know is something that you're working very much in. Yeah, thank you uh, for uh, asking me. Yeah, uh, my, my current interest is rather on the field of not so high quality graphene as it was presented here, because we, we were in some projects where we applied uh, graphene, not only graphene, but also carbon nanomaterial, like, like uh, carbon uh, nanotubes uh, for thermal uh, um, uh, cooling properties of uh, electronics. I think we got to a certain level, we were, uh, we were a little bit, uh, we were successful with that. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we apply several uh, printing technologies like aerosol and inkjet printing, but also screen printing and some more, more exotic printing technologies. And yeah, so we're not producing graphene, but uh, we're applying it and we are uh, characterizing, characterizing it. And I think one of the interesting properties of this graphene material is also the thermal conductivity, which is a little bit different to what was discussed here. But 
I heard also, for example, from ATNS that they are also interested in, in, in that property. So maybe that's another you know, topic which, which uh, graphene can, can help in the future. Your own research in EPIC has actually interacted with many EPIC members on volume production processes, like the roll-to-roll -roll one for micro-optics. Do you see as a, on the inject printing that I know you're, you're working in on for the one on roll-to-roll, -roll, a role that this company present today could play in, or is there an idea to integrate graphene into these uh, large volume production processes? Yeah, of, of course, definitely. So uh, inkjet and aerosol jet printing are large-scale uh, um, processes. Uh, the problem is uh, the problem, uh, to integrate it in a, in a high quality uh, status. As we saw that that we could, when we have single, uh, we have sheets of graphene, for example, integrated into in the aerosol jet printed layers. Um, but of course, then you have not single crystals and you not have um, one layer of, of graphene, but you have several uh, uh, multiple layers, so, so five five layers or what, uh, for example. And and I see to really integrate a, a single layer. Or a, a polycrystalline layer of, of um, which is only a few nanometer thick, uh, in a in a road to road process by printing uh, um, the uh, procedures. This is quite quite demanding, and uh, I don't know if there is currently a technology which can provide that. Thank you very much. And the good thing of this meeting, you say your need and then you will be contacted offline. But what I want to do is I want to close the meeting now because almost five. But first, I would like to go to Cedric, to Alessio, to Oli and to Tapani for a final remark and perhaps a suggestion of what EPIC should do for the next meeting. Which other company shall we bring? We were asked to bring the semiconductor company to the table and we deliver. What should be your next step? Cedric. Once again, thank you so much for being at this meeting. It meant a lot to me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> being uh, I, I'm always interested in 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 um, more interaction with and and I had already uh, interaction uh, to chat and so on with with uh, two manufacturers with with companies who can who can help us in in making metrology building up the ecosystem so that we can basically bring these materials to the semiconductor standard levels because i and i'm i'm really believing that once these materials can be integrated like silicon like 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 high k materials uh, to ald processes or, or that that there is they're, they're on the shelf from the semiconductor industry you will see a gigantic amount of of uh, applications that will pop up pop up uh, from these materials and and I think that that's what we need to do uh, um, and yeah okay Th in that sense that's my interest. Alessio what about you so we want to be different from the from the graphene flagship if we really want to to really help by bringing the integrators that are actually in or in our network anyway to bring them to the table which companies do you think we should bring next time? Oh f f first of all let me say that uh, the uh, graphene flagship interaction is very important for all the yes. companies uh, uh, because because uh, it's uh, the, the know-how is there and uh, of course we we need to have uh, uh, the flagship help and in particular for example IMEC thanks to Cedric uh, to um, exploit what uh, uh, has been done on graphene. Uh, I think it's very urgent to. Uh, start a conversation with the manufacturers. So I'm meaning big fabs, because uh, uh, it's, it's true that we can develop in our small facilities as R&D or pilot line, like uh, at IMEC, et cetera, uh, the graphene uh, um, technology. But then how to move, the next step would be for sure the introduction of this technology in the places where there will be a massive production. So we must be ready. So for sure, an interaction with such kind of entities is going to be very important. And of course, in particular for our application, an interaction with the final users, so the, or the supply chain of the telecommunication industry is very important for the technology validation and introduction. Uh, Tapani, for us, as a shortwave infrared camera manufacturer, uh, you're going to be also participating next Monday on the low light cameras meeting. But on this graphene community, what challenge would you give Epic? Well, uh, if, um, if talking about really, I, I was kind of, a, I, I will put now graphene flagship hat on, on because I, I'm quite uh, keen on, on that uh, uh, that pr program. So, so uh, 
one thing what came to my mind here and uh, listening many of the questions so that there all all the presentations what we gave uh, gave uh, uh, today were were related to to the very high end of uh, graphene or applications where you need uh, the uh, the really the most uh, uh, a highest quality quality graphene graphene to make make sense of it but there, there are so many different other other uh, areas related to uh, maybe use of graphene exactly to uh, thermal management or using it in different composite materials water uh, and 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 so on so that they're looking maybe a little bit more on on also also this uh, uh, type of uh, Type of other other type of graphene materials materials that there might make sense for many of the applications for their, what what exist in photonic photonic industry as well. And to close the meeting, Oli, you were our first graphene uh, company, and now you are our last one speaking today. Give me a task. Give me homework. I love working for you. <laughs> okay, uh, if you insist, Jose. Um, so more, I think just more, right? More people, more voices. Um, this would be, uh, this would be very helpful. The exchange of ideas and the exchange of direction. Um, they say, you know, the, um, we want to get the, the point of intercept correct. And so the more we can learn about that point of intercept, um, the, yeah, the, more, the more enjoyable the development process. We started today and this is only the beginning. Stay tuned for more activities of EPIC on the graphene technologies. I want to summarize with the fact that we actually compare the graphene for silicon photonics and for the shortwave infrared cameras. And we could see that there is huge added value here. We had the right foundries, we had the right device manufacturers, and most important, we had the others challenging them. I hope to continue that field. And I also want to tell you that now it is time to have a drink. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. If you are in our Zoom room, our informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow-up is important. But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's 